Hi, I'm Ryan Harrell from Mini Quad Test Bench, and uh, welcome to Mini Quad Test Bench. <laughs> yeah, this is it. So, is it. yeah, for people who don't already know, what is Mini Quad Test Bench, and, and what do you do here? Um, so, back when we started, back long ago, before Mini Quads were really a big thing, um, there was not a lot of reliable information as far as uh, what, how ESCs performed, how motors performed. We basically relied purely on manufacturer spec sheets, and we all know how accurate those are. Um, so when we built quads, we had to kind of guess, and I got really tired of guessing. So I, uh, I had some, some background in robotics and automation and things uh, just messing around, and I'm like, I can probably make something that we could get information from this stuff and actually have a consistent environment to test this in. Um, so my, my background, uh, I've, I've done some work in academic research and things. That, you know, I work at the university uh, up the road here. So I, I kind of wrapped my head around it for a while, built my own thrust stand and uh, uh, you know, all, of, all of the wrote the software on the, the firmware for the, the stand and uh, pulled, pulled all the components in from the, to pull it into the computer and uh, kind of set up my own system to automate all of the tests and, and get a consistent uh, test environment and so for about oh, three years now I've been testing um, motors um, pretty much uh, mini quad motors uh, I do the here on this bench do the the 4s tests uh, so mid and high kV tests and Ryan Evans out in uh, Oregon is doing uh, the low kV testing just brought him on recently let's talk about your test stand setup mm -hmm. I think people have seen like like the hobby King test stand sure how why aren't you just using an off-the-shelf test stand? Why'd you write your own? Right. So I was I started out with the Hobby King hardware, um, and I didn't have it, the first problem I ran into is it didn't have a way of logging the data. So I could get the data by like writing it down, but there was no way of saving that data directly to the um, you know to a, a file that I could import into a database. So I initially when I initially wrote the software that I'm using uh, to capture it, I was using the Hobby King stand itself. And then um, uh, just using my hardware to read the sensors from the, that stand. Uh, but I, I quickly ran into issues because the Hobby King stand uses bearings on a rail. Um, and that actually, that kind of motion introduces a variable variability, um, a lack of repeatability into the, uh, into the data. So I would get quite a bit of variance on the thrust data just depending on how smoothly that, um, that, bearing was operating and if it would get slightly stuck then it might impact the results so what I ended up doing um, I had a buddy uh, of mine uh, fabricate me uh, and weld a uh, bracket here with the, the cross brace um, holes in the top and it's mounted directly to the load cell uh, so that that's a, a physical connection there's no mechanical parts uh, it's just directly mounted to the load cell uh, and that removes a lot of variables from from that and now my my thrust is repeatable down to one gram so it's it's remarkably s stable now this is something i've run into when trying to do tests for example on video transmitter output power is mm -hmm. is not it's really easy to buy a tool and run one test and then produce a result that you publish and people go oh but repeatability mm -hmm. and variability is is a real challenge yeah that's um, and that's setting this up that was probably the biggest thing that I faced was trying to be able to get consistent results especially over time now, I've been testing motors for three years now so making sure that that data stays consistent I mean there is some drift uh, in, mm -hmm. in my data as we've separated out um, you know as I've improved the stand it's gotten better over time so maybe some of the very early results would would have a, a larger variance from from what has become the standard than the later results um, but I have put a lot of effort into making it repeatable. I have, you know, uh, an actual calibration weight here that I use that I test. Um, I don't test e between every motor. I don't check it, but I check, you know, maybe every fifth motor or something. I'm um, just confirm that the the um, the the weight is actually still reading um, there. And you know, I'll throw on heavier weights every maybe every six months or so just to to verify the whole curve is still consistent. Um, 
And then, of course, when we were setting up the second stand uh, for for Evan Ryan Evans out in, in Oregon, we went through a huge, huge. It took us six months of testing, comparing, sending motors back and forth um, to to make sure that the same motor is giving the same results on both stands. Um, environmental variables play a pretty big role. Um, we ended up having to do. Um, some adjustment formulas to make up for any differences in environmental, you know, variables in terms of, of altitude and, and average humidity and things like that. So, why does why does altitude matter? So air density makes a difference when you're dealing with um, with the you know airflow through a prop. Uh, it's going to produce different thrusts, uh, different densities. So here, it, at any given location, it doesn't vary too dramatically. I mean, you're looking at maybe 15 grams of thrust at maximum on a you know on a 1500 gram thrust output, maybe 15 or 20 grams difference. So like one percent, um, not not significant. But when you move locations completely, that can be pretty dramatic. Let's talk about your power supply. So initially, when I first started testing, I was um, I was using a battery and that worked but it introduces a lot of variability because as a battery ages the the current that it can deliver starts to to shift and um, even you know you can only run one test before you have to recharge the battery to get it back to the initial point so if you're testing 10 props you know you're recharging the battery between every maybe every two or three props at least um, once the, the voltage gets far enough out that it starts impacting the results so that was not ideal um, so what I ended up doing uh, fairly quickly uh, after a few first, you know, uh, maybe 10 or 15 motors that I tested, I, I got a Venom to donate a uh, one of their uh, like 1250 watt power supplies. And I was using that for quite a long time. Um, the issue I ran into with that one is that it was a short circuit protection, not a current limited protection in terms of how it protects the, the power supply from getting damaged when, when something goes wrong. Uh, so particularly on the bigger motors like 2208, 2207, uh, high KV motors, uh, it was pulling, it was acting on the stand like a short circuit. So it would trigger the short circuit protection when you were running heavy props and it was just pulling a lot. It would, the whole power supply would shut down in the middle of the test. So that was not really acceptable. I couldn't test the larger motors. So um, eventually I ended up having to buy um, a kind of a lab grade current limited power supply. Um, the one I have here is, uh, is a 50 amp continuous and the, the one Ryan Evans uses is an 80 amp continuous because he's dealing with a little bit um, beefier setups due to the high voltage. Um, there's a capacitor here and a backup battery that kind of is in parallel with the circuit. So when it's all wired up and ready to test, um, the power comes out of here, goes into the capacitor this battery plugs in in parallel and then that goes into the um, into the, the ESC power supply, the current sensor here and then through into the ESC. So this is actually really critical because this is a current limited power supply. Those instant transitions in motors when they're when they're spinning up between RPMs very very quickly are drawing significantly more than 50 amps that, that this can sustain. So, I mean, I haven't really run into issues with sustained 50 amp draws. At that point, it's not really practical anyway, so 50 amps is fine um, in terms of sustained draw, but I need to have a buffer um, between the, the current limiting and the power supply and the motor in order to kind of get rid of those peaks that would make the current limiting kick in and basically reduce the speed at which the motor was changing RPMs. So if the motor can't draw that current, if the current limiter is kicking in, it's simply going to slow down and not change speeds as quickly. So I want to let the motor do what it's going to do without having to worry about the rest of the system impacting it. So the capacitor and the battery allow the um, allow the voltage and the to be sustained and the current to be sustained in those um, in those high peaks so you basically have the power supply pushing through and then these acting as a buffer that that absorbs those you know gigantic peaks of of current draw that the motor draws during during transitions what, what would you say to the argument that running the tests off this power supply is it's not reflect the motor's performance in real life on a battery. Well, I mean, static results aren't designed to reflect the motor's real performance. I mean, what they're designed to do is eliminate all other variables so that you compare one motor against the other motor. So it's 
you know, part of what we have to do when we're interpreting the results is understand how that translates into flight. It's not going to be a one-to-one. -one. It never was. What it's going to do is it's going to give us a directly comparable result when we're comparing two motors against each other. So we can know, hey, this variable that we changed in the motor design has this impact on what the motor is actually capable of producing. So then it's up to us to say, okay, well, can the battery actually deliver that kind of thing enough to make a difference in handling? Or if it does, like, how does that impact handling? So the, the really critical points here are the differences between motors, not the performance of any one motor on one stand relative to in flight. That's, I mean, and that's why, that's why it's so important to make sure like our two stands between um, Ryan Evans and myself are consistent with each other because what we're testing is comparability, not, I mean, the, the raw value doesn't really matter so much. It only mm -hmm. matters in the context of being comparable to the other motors that we've already tested. So if you've flown a motor and you know how that motor feels, you can look at that motor in the data explorer, compare it to another motor in the data explorer, look at how they are different in the data explorer, and then extrapolate that into how it's going to impact in, in, in the air. Then you can take those, you can fly them, test it, see if your prediction holds water, and you know, just over time you kind of start to get a feel for how all of those variables interact with each other both on the bench and in the air. Yeah, I think I think it's that's really relevant uh, because for if you take a look at somebody else out there who's doing motor tests like Engineer X, mm -hmm. you and Engineer X may produce different results for a given motor, and that's because you're right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. He he definitely gets uh, slightly slightly higher thrust numbers and slightly higher current draw, um, but but. It, that again, that doesn't matter. What matters is that his results are consistent with mine in terms of their relationship to the other motors that he's tested. Right. So we can look at our two test results, and I will often use his his numbers. If I have if something looks weird on my test results, and I'm like that that's really odd, I will often verify against what he's doing um, to see if his if the difference in his um, tests are the same as what I'm seeing in mine. And and there's been a couple of instances where it confirmed that yeah, there's something weird going on with this motor. Um, like even though it's stating this KV, it actually is a much higher KV and getting you know very different results. So um, that that's a nice way of double checking my results and making sure that they're con they're actually accurate and, and to what's going on with the motors. What's the motor that you're testing now that you're most excited about? <laughs> um, I can't talk about that one actually. Oh um, no no, <laughs> not a prototype. What do you got? What do you got on the bench? Um, that you're there's some really interesting stuff on here. I've got uh, these X Xing uh, iFlight Xing motors are, are pretty interesting. Um, kind of this curved bell design. Um, seen it on a couple of motors, the Carrera and. Um, the RCN power also has a kind of a curved shape. Uh, the interesting thing is the RCN power is a single piece in the Xing, and I also believe the Carrera are, um, you can see there's a seam there where it's actually two pieces. Um, Bob Ruge says that taller motors are better than wider motors. Do you agree or disagree? Well, I mean, it's, as we were talking about earlier, it's, it's extremely subjective to your style of flying. Um, if you're doing a lot of proximity work and you are, um, you know, expecting a certain amount of low throttle control, you may hate 2207 or higher, taller stators. Um, you may hate the way they feel, but if you're, you know, if you're flying in a different way where you're using a different part of the throttle curve, um, and that's your maximum, you know, where you're expecting your maximum output to be, then you may love 2207 or 2208 or 228 and a half or 2212. So, um, <laughs> so Bob Ruge is wrong. No. <laughs> Bob Ruge is right for Bob Ruge. <laughs> I'll just try this. Shit. You know, I 